just a general question I want to throw out there, and I love that I, this completely is a discussion based yeah. class today. Absolutely. <laughs> if if I'm just I, sh I shouldn't have put a lecture at the top because it's not that. This is like based off of you giving me stuff and me throwing it back in your face. That's what makes this works. Makes this works. <laughs> so what does ethics mean? What what does the word ethics mean to you? Some morals. Some morals. Okay. A code of conduct. A code. Yeah. Conduct. Yeah. What's right? What's wrong? Okay. It, it's more something that's like done because it feels right rather than because it's written down okay. to be correct or th that's how I interpret it most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, do you all have ethics? Were you given ethics? Did you make them up? I can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so were you were you given ethics? Or, or did you make some up? Do you have ethics? You can make some like a business makes a code of ethics. Okay, so yeah, so, so you can make an organization can put cobble something together and then hand it to its employees. Yeah. Has anybody had one of those before? Yeah, where? Um, I worked for an event company and so we had a certain rule of ethics because we would be let into strangers homes to put on events and yeah. it's kind of important. Right. Um, do you remember anything that was on there? Like any of the, I mean, one of the things that uh, it said in the code? We couldn't work if our fingerprints weren't updated every year. So like our fingerprints had to be updated every year. With like FBI or whatever? Well not FBI, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Background checks? Yeah, background checks every year. Okay, so I heard the, the phrase code of ethics. Uh, is that something that's written every time? No? So what would be, sorry because you answered with your face, now I'm asking. <laughs> so, so what would be an example of a code of ethics that's not written down? Just day to day living, like how you supposed to interact with the channel, like the pirate code. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just like how like you're expected to go around like living your life, like uh, interacting with other people. Supposed to. Yeah. Okay. So here I'm gonna throw this on top. According to who? According to who, then? I think a lot of it's based off of how you're raised, how your parents raise you, maybe where you're from, the kind of environment you grew up in. I think that affects your ethics a lot. Has anybody been raised in an environment or with parents, and you developed a code of ethics, and then maybe even during college have started to question some of those ethics? That you were brought up with? No. I, I mean, I've definitely, so I've definitely met other people in college who you can tell were raised on a different code of ethics. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't say that I personally have been questioning my own code of ethics, yeah. but. Other um, people's. Well, other, people, yeah, other than yeah. maybe gun control. Yeah. Okay. Because, yeah. I mean, coming from New York, there's lots of gun control legislation that sure. gets pushed through there. And, most people that you talk to about gun control in North Dakota are not going to be fans of it. But that's not really an ethical issue, more of a, a legal thing. Sure. But just like the kind of, I was raised in a household where, um, you know, guns are dangerous and anything that can shoot a projectile is a gun. Mm -hmm. And so you don't point it at people because it has the potential to be used as a weapon. And then, you know, certainly the people out here that do have know, many weapons and shoot recreationally and that kind of, those kinds of things, it's not like they treat the weapons without respect or handle them unsafely. 
it's just a, a very different attitude towards the weapons than that. So attitude can play into, do you think, code of ethics as well, or ethics, ethical discussions? And why there's ethical discussions? Like why, there, why is there room for discussion or debate with ethics? There's no absolute right or wrong yeah. way of putting it. It's certainly gray. It's very seldom black and white. And that's why these codes are written down for people because they're like, here's the code of, here's, so that someone who's new to an organization or something that has a code of ethics, they're like, you don't know anything, this right here will get you in line. If, you know, because they may be raised or been from a different environment, different country, where it's okay to, like Fred said, put a dog in the freezer, right? <laughs> well, one, of my, one of my friends is from um, Saudi Arabia, and we went to like a cultural night, and in their culture, you see a baby and you kiss the baby. It doesn't matter whose baby it is, sure. you see a baby, and I'm like, no, 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 we don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Right. You don't just go pick up random human babies. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you just don't do that. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> So are any of you right now, right now, bound by one of those formal code codes? Yes. You are? Yes. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. So three people out of the room? Just three? Anybody else right now know that they're on one of those, here's our code of ethics? There's a student code of ethics. Yes. There's a student code of ethics. Let's start there, shall we? All right. There it is. Oh, right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to go there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there. So this is the student code of ethics here at UND. You're all bound by it. You probably haven't read this, right? No. 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 Haven't read this. We have a code? Yeah. <laughs> there it is, and it's broken down into these six areas. Um, and, you know, dishonesty. What is that? It's pretty... I'm sure you've been dishonest a few times since you've been at UND. Um, it does get into some black and white things, but also goes into that gray area. Um, there was acts against self or other persons. Um, we're just talking about, I think that's the one. Gazing. Stalking. Where's the line on stalking? Right? Okay. Um, now this is a weather class, right? So we're going to tip this over a little bit into there. Um, as, uh, as you being a consumer of media, all different types, internet, video, whatever, um, I want to ask you a question. I'd love it if I could get some answers. Um, what do you think is important for people who make the news, including weathercasters, um, that they have to do to be ethical? What are some of the things that you think they have? You have to do this if you are part of the media, getting things out there. An absolute, what do you have to do? Bare bones, minimum. So, like, attribute a quote to someone who didn't say it. Okay, so you can't misrepresent. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. You can't copy someone else's work. Yeah, can't copy someone else and say it's yours. Okay. Can't make up information. Can't make up information. That'd probably be a good one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're looked at as a source of information. has to do. They have to do this in terms of getting information out to people. In that case, you have to alert people if there's going to be something really bad happening that they need to protect themselves or their property for. Okay. I think that's something that's okay. important. So you don't hide deadly information, basically, yeah. is what you're saying. Okay, gotta get the word out. 
part of your job. Okay. What else? For a weather caster, they have to tell the weather. Pardon? They have to tell the weather. Yeah. They're weather caster. Right. So they have to tell it. They have to know it. Okay. Right. So, what would happen? Let's think of a world where ethics did not matter. And let's talk about that just for a second. Uh, and let's stick with weather. So you've got, let's call him the unethical weather guy. <laughs> and he's, he's doing stuff. What are some of the things you would think he would do? The unethical weather guy. Say something's happening that's not just to mess with people. So say there's a blizzard coming and there's not. And then okay. So kind of going. To but that. to the extremes, not like oh it's gonna rain. Yeah, it like doesn't really. This rain. storm could kill you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. What else would an unethical weather guy say? Uh, Fourteen day forecast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> yes, they would. <laughs> That's yes. a great example. Okay. Uh, something that I see happen, like actually happen, is a bunch of weather casters, especially in like southern Tornado Alley, will predict the severity of tornadoes before anything happens. Mm -hmm. Sure. We're going to talk about why they do that. Okay. Anything else you think that they would do, the unethical weather guy, just for fun? Hopefully this doesn't ever exist. Okay. All right. So let's think a little bit more about the role of the weather caster. What is that role? What do you think the role of the weather caster is? I'll write it up here with nothing. Do you need a marker? Oh, no, I'm good. Are you sure? We'll just pretend. Okay. So what is the role of a weather caster? So, information about weather. Okay, what else? And how do they get that information? They collect it from the National Weather Service yeah. and models. Of Scientists, weather. right? And then what did you say again exactly? Conveying weather. Convey, information. You're communicating that? Yeah. Said, so, communicator? I'm just going exactly what I've written down. <laughs> so, I have scientist. And I've got communicator. One more thing, in my opinion, to be an effective weathercaster. That would be the science part, and I would say. Well, and that's a combo of science and communicating, I think. And that's a really good point. Not using jargon and all that stuff. Getting it so it's understandable. What's the? Do you have a favorite weathercaster? Why do you like them? Entertaining. Entertaining. So that's the that's the trifecta for me. Those two, three things, scientist, communicator, and entertainer, okay? I think if any of those three fall off, you don't have a really great weather cast, okay? Because it is science, and it's the same every day, every week, every month. It's just the seasons, and we've all seen them, and we know rain's coming, and we know it's going to be sunny, and we know our grass is going to get green if it rains, and so they have to get it out to us in a way that we, uh, we can stomach. Um, I wanted to show you this. Here's an early code, right, for some people. The RTDNA Code of Ethics. There are two code of ethics that journalists look at. This is one of them, Radio Television Digital News Association. Um, Truth and accuracy, above all. It sounds kind of journalism type thing, right? Independence and transparency. Kind of just going to the main things here. Accountability for consequences. Okay? You tell people something, you need to know what the consequences of that are going to be. Okay? I really actually like the SPJ, Site Professional Journalist Code of Ethics, a little better. Look, I'm going to have to make it fat. Seek truth and report it. Minimize harm. Act independently. Be accountable and transparent. Those are the, the main themes. Um, just taking what I just said, those, those main themes, 
what, which ones do you think apply to a weather caster as well? Of those that I was kind of spewing on. The not doing any harm? Yes. Yep. Any other ones? Portraying the truth accurately. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's another one. All of it. Every single line of it. If you're planning on doing this for a living, you're going to want to look at these things. Because if you are part of a, uh, a news team, a news station, if you're going to be broadcasting weather or over the internet, sending this out, here's the thing about the 14 day forecast. And that was such a great example. There are 10 day forecasts, right? And how accurate are those? Seriously. Not very right, but they have them because Granny sitting at home who pulls up the 10 day forecast, they have no clue. So, where does that all of a sudden start getting into the ethics of maybe even minimizing harm or seek the truth and report it? How about that? Just because a model can go out that long, we can throw that out there as information? I don't know. Maybe it should come with a big fat disclaimer, like, you know what, this really probably isn't going to happen. But they put it out there because, hey, if Joe Schmo only has a five day, I found a site that has a 10 day. You know, people don't know. And that's your role as somebody who's giving out that information. It has to be held to a certain standard. And that's what these code of ethics do. Um, so I want to watch something. Dateline NBC, a primetime news program, airs a story in 1992 entitled Waiting to Explode. The story includes footage demonstrating that a line of trucks produced by General Motors readily explode on impact. To see for ourselves what might happen in a side impact crash, Dateline NBC hired the Institute for Safety Analysis to conduct crash demonstrations. Unlike GM tests, the fuel tanks were filled with real gasoline. Look what happened. At impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank. According to our experts, the pressure of the collision and the crushing of the gas tank forced gasoline to spew from the gas cap. The fuel then erupted into flames when ignited by the impacting car's headlight. After the program ends, one of the firemen at the taping of the crash contacts GM. So, so far, what do you think of these trucks? If you're sitting and I'm watching this story, and you're like, oh my gosh, I have one of those trucks. <laughs> Freaking out, right? I'm gonna die. The conversation inspires a full-scale investigation. Three months later, NBC is forced to reveal their role in fabricating the news. <laughs> NBC's contractor did put incendiary devices under the trucks to ensure that there would be a fire if gasoline were released from the truck's gas tank. We said the crash, quote, forced gasoline to spew from the fuel cap, end quote. GM says since the gas cap was the wrong cap for the GM filler tube, and because the gas tank was overfilled, the cap came off when the impact occurred. We agree with GM that we should have told our viewers about these devices. The Dateline reporter, however, said, quote, at impact, a small hole was punctured in the tank, unquote. GM has now x-rayed that tank and found no hole. We acknowledge the placing of the incendiary devices under the truck was a bad idea from start to finish. That's our new policy, and we'll be right back. New policy? <laughs> Come on! Oh, heads rolled when this happened. Like, seriously. Okay, so... There's so much with this, but when you think of this, oh, when you think of this, um, so what does this do? First of all, uh, what do you think of the report who put this story together? If you watch this story, then you found out, holy moly, this was all fabricated. What do you think of that report? I'm sure what the job is. 
I've been duped. I watch Dateline. I love Dateline. I've been duped. I, so then what other questions pop up in your head? What about that story the next week on yeah, Dateline? Right. What, or what about the 10 other stories I watched and I thought were, is this news at all? So that's why there's a code of ethics. And every journalist, including weathercasters, are held to this. And you know who really holds them accountable? Themselves. So that's crazy, because you're going to have idiots working there, right? Why would they want to show that story? How, can you see how this might have happened? How did this happen? To get ratings. To get ratings, yeah. So they get a tip. Or they look at some stats that these trucks are blowing up, or whatever, right? Maybe it was one, who knows? But they go, oh, we can make a story. This is like huge, right? Because these are mass produced trucks in the US, they're all over the place, people are driving them, there's kids, and yada, yada. This is huge. They start going through all the paces, they start, okay, what can we do? Well, wouldn't it be awesome if we could like make one explode? Like have a, somebody come in and do the test? Yeah, yeah. They do the test, nothing happens. Ah. What if we blow it up ourselves? <laughs> That's where the <laughs> happened, right? With that, that whole story. I'd have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that, that one moment. Because they're also wrapped, this team, and it wasn't just one reporter. It was a couple producers and whatever, and somebody else had to okay it, and we need to get explosives, and uh, you know, they had to buy them and make it happen. That's a lot of work, but they get so far in that it's like, we're, well, yeah, and then we're going to have to take a different kind of cap because it's not spewing enough gas out, so we're going to change this to a plastic one, and so it just snowballed, and then they had to go on air and basically say they're all idiots to the nation that really likes watching Dateline. They lost so much, but the biggest thing they lost was credibility, and to a news organization, that's everything. To a meteorologist, it's everything, right? Now, the thing with meteorologists is they're constantly dealing with the future, something that's never happened yet, and making their best guess based off of information they get, what's going to happen. Can you think of a time when a meteorologist really screwed up? The Galveston. What happened there? Um, the the person who was in charge of the forecasting office for Galveston had just written a paper fairly recently. This was in like the early 1900s, like what? 1902, is that right, Fred? Yeah, 1900 actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's so he had, he had just written a paper basically saying that hurricanes don't hit Texas. <laughs> and so the forecast was saying, hey, this hurricane's going to hit yeah. Texas. It's going to hit Galveston. And he said, well, hurricanes don't hit Texas. And so the forecast didn't get out until like the night before. And so Galveston, which is right on the coast, wasn't evacuated and like thousands of people died. Mm. Uh, yeah. Was it 8,000 or 10,000? One biggest so, weather disaster. So you think, too, what the repercussions of that is uh, are, sorry, that. It's not just that weather office, it's meteorologists in general. They can't be trusted. What? They put this out? It's not true? So oftentimes these code of ethics um, are really there to help protect the organizations. Here's another video I want to show you. But first, the severe flooding here in the Northeast as warm rain continues to fall today. And he sees Michelle Kaczynski, I guess she's in the canoe, is in Wayne, New Jersey this morning. Hi, Michelle, good morning to you. Good morning. Well, obviously we're getting a nice break from the rain, but not the flooding. This is essentially <laughs> say, a river in this neighborhood. It rushed in yesterday through the street, and it's really tough to control a canoe or a boat when you're out in it. Much deeper back there because this is. Actually, Michelle, I'll take it. Is there some kind of severe drop off yeah. there uh, between the floor ground? We still go back. We saw these guys a second ago. Michelle walking. Are these holy men walking? <laughs> 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 What's going on here? When you have a ride like this, why don't you want to walk? Have you run a short? 
sure. <laughs> Well, they, could, they wouldn't let me go back into the deep water because they were afraid I would just drift away. Piece of video there, Michelle. Is, is your oar hitting ground, Michelle? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's how these work. These lives. They don't work with her. She's from the NBC affiliate in that area. They do a live cut-in uh, so that they can get breaking news from a place. That was Michelle, and that was her big break. She was going to be on the Today Show. This is awesome. I'm getting in the good. <laughs> uh, so when you saw that, and you were laughing, I mean, the whole nation saw that. Um, they handled this the right way. They called her out immediately because they knew, holy crap. It's staging is what it's called. You stage something. It looks like she's floating in the middle of a street and oh my gosh, it's devastating. Wait a second, those dudes are walking and it's ankle deep, you know? So that's called staging. They called her out on it, their own person. They're making fun of her. But they know that if they didn't, it'd be really bad because people aren't stupid, right? So that's how Journalists and weathercasters get into trouble sometimes is it's their big break. It's the big storm. This is the storm. This is the one that I get to, you know, get to find it. This is my storm. And I get to tell people about it. Right? So that's how people get into trouble with ethics. Uh, did you know that Noah has a code of ethics? You ever seen it? It is very sciencey. I read through, I didn't read through the whole thing, trust me, I did not. Um, they kind of go through in sections, and they really don't get to the ethics part till after they explain how this is all put together, definitions of words that are in the code. And then you start getting into principles of scientific integrity. There's that word then all of a sudden, integrity. Now we're starting to get into the ethics stuff. What is integrity? What is integrity? Do you know what integrity is? I know what integrity is. Does anybody not? Well, you wouldn't admit to not knowing it now. <laughs> Who knows what integrity is? Even though that would be a violation of integrity. It <laughs> it's integral to. Um, so, know that almost every organization will have some sort of code of ethics or um, they'll have policies and procedures, but those are different from ethics. And the ethics are where you're usually given some leeway to make decisions yourself based off this code of ethics. I want to ask you a, a question and I want an answer for this. Is it okay for a TV or video weathercaster, because we've got the web now with all the video stuff on it. Is it okay for them to say, this storm can kill you? Oh, God. You're referring to a certain. Yes. Am I? Yes. Is it okay for someone to say that? It depends. It depends on what? The storm. So, I mean. I mean, I would, I would say yes, if, yeah. you're, if you're presenting the truth, like if this storm is approaching with deadly force, then... But is it, it, is it? Because just about any storm can kill somebody, theoretically, even if it's just a heavy rainstorm, someone doesn't have their windshield wipers working correctly and then they crash their car. Lightning, is it, any lightning is it? I mean, is it inaccurate to say it? No. I mean, it's not something I would say lightly, but... But why not? Because it could kill you. <laughs> what, so where is that line then between what you two are talking about from I'm going to say it, I'm not going to say it. What's the level of the storm? What's the... Can you figure that out? Put it down on paper for me? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, what, what defines a heap of rice? How many grains of rice are in it? Right. <laughs> Okay, um, so so I'm hearing it's okay. I, I mean, so 
there's I, a lot of factors. I think the, the easy line to draw, the easy question to ask yourself is, you know, is there something that they can do that will make them significantly safer? Whether that be, you know, during the thunderstorm, going inside during the thunderstorm. You know, that's something that you're... have to tell people if you're like a broadcast meteorologist because they're taught that by you know their parents and their school teachers and stuff but if it's something like a, a hurricane and you need to evacuate for the hurricane evacuating uh, an area that's going to be affected by a hurricane will greatly increase your chance of survival so that's when you'd say it can kill you and I mean I I would then put the caveat on if you don't evacuate this storm could be deadly Okay, so what you're saying is whenever evacuation is involved, it's okay to say this storm can kill you. I mean, I heard it a lot growing up with severe tornado outbreaks. So any, so any tornado, mm -hmm. even though it hasn't even maybe touched down yet, I wouldn't say that. This storm can kill you. <laughs> Well, I mean, no, I can't. Trying to be so warmed about it when you're doing it. But this person is. Uh, is this, this storm can kill you. Is, this but is it okay? Yes. 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 I mean, with Noah, I, you can't say that. You can't say something that's indefinite, like this storm can kill you. They can't um, provide. So you can't predict life or death, but you no. can predict the weather. Yes. So, here's a scenario. The National Weather Service issued a statement saying a hurricane has potential to do extensive damage and threaten human life. You've been following this storm from the beginning. Your expertise and passion is hurricanes. Your hurricane chasing experiences and research tell you this is not going to be as bad as they are warning. You know this. What do you tell viewers in your upcoming weathercast in one hour? You are? So the National Weather Service saying it has potential to do extensive damage and threaten human life. You're going to say... You don't have to say the National Weather Service is wrong. You can just say that in the last hour this has happened, the storm isn't going to be as bad, you're not to put blame on anybody else. So. This was actually covered in the textbook that Fred had us reading. Really? Yep. And so the news stations have more leeway than the National Weather Service does in the National Hurricane Center. And so if there is something, and it's not leeway for like your personal opinion on what you think the hurricane's going to do. It's usually leeway on developments that you've mm -hmm. seen in the past like six hours that the National Hurricane Center hasn't had time to release a statement on. Or whatever. Okay. okay. Well, let's throw in the uh, the whole uh, evacuation card. So they throw out an evacuation. And you, you don't think based on what you're looking at, it's not going to be as bad. They shouldn't have to evacuate. Would you say anything? Or not? With an evacuation, that goes under a lot of scrutiny from the Weather Service. They don't say like, uh, let's just say, let's evacuate people. Mm -hmm. well, like that's not how it works. So in my, you know, in my feeling would be that if they're saying something like an evacuation. They have to be pretty certain that an evacuation is necessary. Mm -hmm. That I would probably report that. Yeah, I mean, with yes. something like an evacuation, it's probably better to be safe than sorry, but especially yeah. if there's a storm coming, like a hurricane. It has to go through a lot of hands. Um, wouldn't it be great to be right when the whole nation is wrong, though? As a meteorologist, I know uh, during the flood of 2007, uh, 
Neon had a better prediction than the National Weather Service did on how bad it would be. And he gained major street cred after that. Seriously. Every farmer was like, Liam. <laughs> after that. They still talk about it. Um, so, I guess the reason I bring that up is because whether you're a, a forecaster for a private entity or National Weather Service or a news station, um, you've got, as a meteorologist, as a scientist, you've got this credibility issue that you're always dealing with. And, and it's a tough situation because you're always trying to figure out as best you can what it's going to be like in the future. That can change really quickly. And people always remember how you always screw up. So it would be great to just nail the big one, right? So you see where that's, that's where that pressure comes in. Add on top of that, ratings and uh, you know, storm coverage, you know. There's a reason that they call their radar cool things on TV is because they want people to watch them. Weather is the most watched thing in local news. And so they really beat that up. They push resources to that. Um, about evacuations, um, after this happened, they were saying that you know less people probably would have died with staying put than forcing everybody onto the highway. Um, just the way it worked out, you know, there was a bus explosion and whatever else. Um, and then, ah, oh, snap! <laughs> <laughs> what in the world? Um, and then this happened, and they're like, no, we're not going anywhere. They handled it completely differently because um, people get numb for different reasons. They learn from the past, whatever. I'm just riding it out. Um, my sister was in Florida during the hurricane, and um, she stayed put. You know, they felt they were going to be safe where they were, and it ended up being okay. So what does that do? It just affirms to stay, stay put the next time. You know? um, but when you're dealing with people's lives, you can see all those ethical decisions become paramount. Absolutely. Um, and with the weather casting on television, here's a question for you. Do you think that the deaths that happen um, when people are evacuating or trying to get out are a result of non-ethical weather casters generating viewers with over-the-top fear-mongering and exaggerating forecasts? But you can see how, again, there's idiots working everywhere, and there will be people who are so egocentric that they want to nail the storm, be the hero, be the center of attention, whatever that is. Um, and so that's where, again, ethics really start to slide. And it's, it all comes back down to kind of what you were saying, how you were raised, the mentors you've had, through development of being a meteorologist. Um, and even the places where you work can really, the longer you're you just start soaking it in, then you become that. And all of a sudden you realize, you go somewhere else, like, you did what there? What did you do? So you really have to check yourself often with these ethical uh, situations that come up. And it's kind of fun to really put yourself in these situations every once in a while. Watch something that's going on, and then say, okay, if I was in that situation, what would I have done with what I know right now, what my moral compass is, what my code of ethics happens to be right now, what would I have done? Would I have done the same thing? You know, again, not a right or a wrong answer, bunch of great. Uh, does anybody have any questions about 
ethics in general in terms of journalism? What about in the case where, you know, if you're working for a big conglomerate like NBC, ABC, Fox, and at what point is it the ethics of the company versus the ethics of the reporter? Because obviously, like, a reporter may have the most ethics, but their story isn't put on if the station, at what point does that fall on the reporter? Media. <laughs> at what point does it fall on the reporter versus the company? Um, at what point does making the ethical decision you mean? I mean, can a, can a reporter say, no, I'm certainly not yes. doing that, and then I guess they would potentially lose their job, though, yes. I guess. Yeah, and, and uh, okay, so here's another thing with, with uh, ethics with reporters, uh, is that they're given a story. I want you to do the story on gun control. And they're an absolute gun nut. It would be good for them to say, I can't do this because I'm way too involved. Mm -hmm. And then because they can't give an objective view right. of, the, of the topic. And so that is part of the ethics of a journalist. Uh, same with, uh, you, can, you can probably think of a similar situation with a weather caster. If, um, know if, if there's, because they're put on things all the time too. They become the resident scientist of a station. Well, I think about like on the West Coast, we get, we don't ever get snow. And so like if someone after living in the Midwest was like, eh, I'm not going to report on that. That's not a big snowstorm. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. That's all. Thank you. That was good.